Well, it's after lunch and everyone would rather be asleep, right? <laughs> you don't want to be listening to speaker after speaker putting lots of notes up on the screen and uh, lots of facts and figures. The eyes start to get a bit heavy, you know, I understand that. I also learned as a public speaker three things. This will help you, Mr. Moderator. To stand up, to speak up, and then to shut up. <laughs> so, shorter speeches, I understand, are, are probably going to be uh, much more uh, listenable. So, I've tried, I've cut out a lot of, uh, while I've just been waiting, I've cut out uh, a few little slides so that we can move through this uh, fairly quickly. Firstly, I want to say thank you to, all, uh, to Honourable Minister uh, Richard Maru. Thank you very much for your invitation uh, to me to come here. It's a big honour and uh, I really value and appreciate that. I want to thank uh, Prime Minister James Marapi as well. Yes, you can tell I'm an Australian. I, I don't look Chinese. I can only speak a little bit of Chinese. And uh, so, why on earth am I here today? Well, as an Australian, um, I'm very, very uh, uh, pleased to be able to share with you my experience. I've been living in China for the past 12 years in a special economic zone. So if we can get these slides working. So thank you, first of all, that slide, and to the Prime Minister as well. Uh, I've been associated I guess with Papua New Guinea for well over 20 years uh, and been very well connected here to uh, this country here. I guess uh, Australians have been associated uh, for a long time with Papua New Guinea through good times, tough times such as the world wars. I also know that you enjoy uh, rugby league and you're looking forward to seeing a footy team uh, join the uh, NRL possibly the Moresby Chiefs. Something like that would sound good, wouldn't it? Um, and you also honoured us as Australians when you invited our Australian Prime Minister, uh, uh, Anthony Albanese, to be the first foreign speaker or leader to speak on your parliament floor here in Port Moresby just in January of this year. Uh, I enjoyed my uh, first meeting with James Marapi here in Port Moresby back in 2011. You can see us there together in the uh, photo uh, when he was the Minister of Education. He uh, has become a lot more famous, hasn't he? And now as Prime Minister he walks the world stage and is able to lead the people of Papua New Guinea. I was also very encouraged last night with the opening speeches to hear the, and feel the concept of faith. Faith is very, very important to people of Papua New Guinea, to the Prime Minister and to the Honourable Minister. I know that we share faith. I'm a person of faith myself. And faith is such an important thing, particularly in the times in which we live. Do you agree? Don't lose your faith. For the past 12 years, I've been uh, part of a program called Operation Food for Life, which does charitable work in feeding the hungry and the poor on the Baruni uh, rubbish dump, uh, the physically challenged at the Cheshire Disability Services, and of course, patients living with HIV and children at the Port Moresby Hospital. Those incarcerated in the uh, notorious Bamana men's and women's prisons uh, we've established also a, uh, a, a born free sanctuary for the at-risk youth here in uh, Port Moresby and built a primary school for 300 children in the remote Kavori district. So you've got my heart here as well. It's a charity I'm actively involved with and I'm looking forward... And I mean that, you have my heart. So I'm not here to try and sell you anything today. I'm just wanting to share from my experience because I want to see PNG prosper in the way that it can and it should. I was very encouraged by the speeches from your political leaders last night. I couldn't help but find myself applauding because I felt uh, my heart is here very much as well. So yes, I'm an Australian. 
but I'm also here to uh, share a perspective about China. So why is that possible? Because as I said before, I've spent the last 12 years living and working in China. I remarried nine years ago. My wife is Chinese. My business partner is Mr. Tony Lee, and Tony here is here with us today. Tony and I have been pioneering trade opportunities together for more than 15 years. I moved to China to partner with him 12 years ago to increase the influence of China to the world. We now run the largest printer and consumables exhibition and conference in the world every October in Zhuhai, China. Zhuhai is a special economic zone in the Greater Bay Area along with the cities of Hong Kong, Macau, Shenzhen and Guangzhou. That's very exciting, but later in my presentation I'll reveal that that's like a two-sided coin, it's become a weakness as well. Our work has captured the attention of the World Free Zone Organisation and four years ago, just before the pandemic, our office was established as the official China Centre for the World Free Zone Organisation. In fact, Tony has just been attending the World Free Zone meetings in Dubai before he came here to Port Moresby this week. Following a very successful uh, visit by Minister Saroy, and I was very pleased to be reunited with him last evening here, we started working on a strategy to promote strong trade ties between China and PNG. Tony and I, along with our team at RT, as well as the added resources of the World Free Zone organisation, including uh, Dr. Mohan Guruswamy, uh, we are the goodwill ambassadors. And one of my key messages for you today, takeaway messages, is that PNG currently is one of the best kept secrets of the world. Nobody knows about it. And yet, what a wonderful, beautiful country, and it's, it's, it's a big secret. Nobody knows about the investment opportunities that you have here in PNG. Investment opportunities that many would be willing to take up. And I see, Minister, that one of your challenges going ahead is the development of goodwill ambassadors. Not an ambassador in an embassy, I'm talking about a goodwill ambassador to attract investment and trade for PNG. So I'd like to uh, introduce my partner, uh, Tony Lee. Tony, would you like to come up just for a, a brief moment and just say hello to the beautiful people here at PNG. Please welcome Mr. Tony Lee. Uh, I'm very happy to come here. It's my first time come PNG. I just remember, uh, actually, I was born in 1977. In that time, China is uh, very poor. Uh, in my thinking, uh, my memory, uh, it's uh, a few car less, even less than currently uh, Paul Mosby. But after 40 years of development, uh, China is get huge uh, successful. You can see uh, they produce a lot of products and the number one uh, economic uh, in the world. So what I think is what we can do for PNG is the two way. One way is we can print uh, some Chinese invest investment uh, invest uh, come to PNG. This morning I show my friends. I say because he, he called me. I say I'm in PNG. He say, Hey, you should call me. Uh, 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 I can buy a ticket immediately. Come to PNG to see how we can do some things in PNG. I know the uh, in, uh, the a lot of things you need to do, but most important things is opportunities. Let the people to know what kind of opportunities in PNG. So this one I think I can do something for PNG. Another thing is 
you know, China is a big market. So what we can do is we can bring to some products, special PNG products to China market. You know, if we cannot sell like uh, some bean, some uh, coffee bean, some um, uh, like a uh, nano, uh, na uh, na no, uh, uh, cover, this, uh, uh, this kind of these products, big demand in China. So this one, if I say is we can do something for PNG, we can do something for PNG next generation sense. It was interesting to note that uh, President uh, Xi visited Papua New Guinea and uh, declared a very strong relationship between China and Papua New Guinea. Um, it was good to see uh, Minister Saroy also come to visit China and uh, talk about trade opportunities there as well. And uh, the Prime Minister uh, spoke uh, last night very positively, I believe, about a relationship with China. You know, we live in a very strong geopolitical world today. And uh, you're aware of this. You understand what I'm talking about. And yet last night, the Prime Minister didn't even touch on geopolitics. He could talk about China, the United States, European Union, Australia, uh, Japan, Korea, and he could talk positively about the desire to have a strong relationship without geopolitics. And I believe that this is essential and important as we move forward. And I uh, really want to commend the Prime Minister for his speech last night. You know, truth is the first casualty of war. But it's also the first casualty when geopolitics starts to take place. A lot of untruths start to take place. So I have two pieces of counsel that I want to share with you uh, today. Continue to follow the wise actions of your leaders. There is no need to be embroiled in geopolitics. Neither should you sacrifice your sovereignty. I was very pleased yesterday to meet with those who sit down and work out the agreements and the policies so that you actually work with the governments that you're wanting to trade with so that you get the very best deal for Papua New Guinea. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear the discussion uh, yesterday and today even about the fisheries. At the moment, the fish is taken offshore, but you know what? There's a huge opportunity in developing a, uh, an industry here of canning the fish here. Imagine the employment that can take place and the difference that could be made. So I really uh, ask you to uh, urge you to keep your sovereignty in place and think of what is best for the people of Papua New Guinea. This is part of my experience as an Australian living in China for the last 12 years. Um, I have found uh, in my visits, and even listening today, I understand uh, talking at lunchtime and at breakfast time this morning, many people don't really understand what an SEZ, a Special Economic Zone, is. And maybe some of you here are coming for the very first time to try and understand what is an SEZ and how can that help me in my province? How can that help with uh, uh, the economy, with employment, and all the rest of it? Uh, the uh, speaker who just spoke before said, I cannot take my coat off and give it to you. What has worked in Bangladesh is not necessarily going to work here in PNG either. And you should not cut and paste a SEZ model from somewhere else in the world. By all means, listen to the information that you're being uh, uh, presented with these uh, three days. But don't just cut and paste a model and say, that one works so well in uh, 
in, in the European Union. We'll, we'll do, we're just going to cut and paste that. Well, this one works so well in China, we're going to just cut and paste it and do it. It won't work. You can't copy. You've got to listen and you've got to find the strengths of the different models and you need to uh, be able to understand. And of course, a free trade zone is quite different from a special economic zone. A uh, free trade zone, for example, is where goods can be imported, manufactured, processed, and then re-exported with all sorts of tax incentives and uh, benefits as a result. So in China there are free trade zones, but there are also special economic zones as well. And a special e economic zone is uh, designed specifically within a country um, to assist the policies of your country, but the aim is to attract foreign investment, to create jobs and promote economic development. That is a key summary of what a special economic zone ought to be. But how you do it in Bangladesh, how you do that in China, how you do that in PNG is going to be quite different. You need to understand uh, this key difference. So in summary, free trade zone is there focusing primarily on international trade, but if SEZ is focused on attracting foreign investment and promoting economic development. It's very, very important to understand these differences. Another thing uh, to note about a special economic zone that is always connected to good logistics. When you set up your special economic zones here, have a look at what's happened in China. They always put a uh, special economic zone where there's going to be or where there is a port, an airport, uh, good roads, or there is a plan for those things to be put into place. For example, the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone, another model again, it's a free trade zone, um, set up in 2020, uh, now attracts uh, $291 trillion dollars and that is almost one third of Shanghai's total foreign trade. That is a very significant number. Your special economic zones you ought to be playing should also be looking at that. But let's, you know, Shanghai wasn't the first. Let's step back and just have a little bit of a look first, first of all at the uh, different ones. We've all seen the amazing meteoric rise of China, the uh, very fast trains. I mean, where else in the world can you go and uh, have a network of 38,000 kilometres of track with trains travelling at over 300 up to 400 kilometres per hour? Where else in the world can you go where every bus and taxi uh, operated by the government is battery powered and does not run on petrol or diesel. So how did China uh, get so strong so quickly? And of course this goes to the heart of geopolitics where uh, country, some countries are very concerned that China's rise has uh, been so dramatic uh, and uh, it becomes a threat. Becomes a threat because of the ability to trade, to manufacture, to prosper. Of course, we should be looking at the fact that more than 400 million people have been lifted out of poverty as a result of this wealth. Rather than investing money into military pursuits in other countries, China has used that to, uh, to lift uh, the poorest of the poor out of poverty. But there are two main ways. Uh, that China has used to grow. The first one is the special economic zone. The second one is the uh, industrial clusters. An industrial cluster is where a com the country looks at a particular uh, industry and says, this will work really, really well in Zhuhai. 
This one will work really, really well in Shenzhen. This one will work really well in Zhengzhou. And around the country, different industries have uh, prospered as a result because they, the country, the central government, has said that this has said that this particular industry will thrive and we'll get behind it, we'll back it, we'll support it. And in that sense, every, uh, uh, every city has become a special economic zone as a uh, focus on the industrial clusters. So both have uh, been uh, particularly successful. In Zhuhai, uh, uh, where I have been living right down in the south, of China, uh, it has been a, uh, a place where aviation, the aerospace industry, has prospered. China's uh, air show is now run in Zhuhai, in the economic zone of Zhuhai, attracting people from all over the world. Uh, I've been into factories, uh, or a factory, where a plane as large as a 737, Boeing 737, can land on water uh, take up water, take off again, and then go and use that for firefighting or whatever. Uh, these are new technologies that uh, China is uh, focusing on. Also electronics, IT, biotechnology, the pharmaceuticals, uh, new environment protection. These are some of the uh, uh, special cluster groups that have been focused in the special economic zone of Zhuhai. But I, want, uh, I, I published this magazine three years ago because Zhuhai uh, is only really 40 years old as a special economic zone. Uh, that was the front cover uh, of, of, of the magazine that we presented. And uh, uh, we gathered some photographs of what Zhuhai looked like 40 years earlier. Zhuhai was just a small fishing village, very humble fishing village. And it's taken 40 years for Zhuhai to reach the standard where it is now uh, as a special economic zone. It did not happen overnight. Another key message for you to take away is that special economic zones don't just happen overnight. It requires a great deal of effort and patience. The Zhuhai is one of the country's first four special economic zones with Shenzhen, uh, Shenzhou and Xiamen uh, all being opened up in 1980 by the central government. In addition to the original four special economic zones, there are other economic zones in China including the Shanghai, Pudong uh, new area that I mentioned before, the Tianjin, Binhai new area, the Guangzhou, Nansha new area, Chengdu, the Wuhan, uh, East Lake High Tech Development Zone and many others. In fact there are about 19 such zones. There are also 21 pilot free trade zones. Think of these zones are all quite different uh, from, uh, from a special economic zone. And then there's another 230 national economic and technological development zones as well. Each one entirely different uh, from before. So let's look briefly at five quick, uh, key questions. What resources has China invested? How many SEZs have given, uh, how have they given back to China? How much foreign investment has been generated? Which industries benefited the most? And what has been the successes and failures of SEZs? It's quite possible that PNG can learn from China's experience. So the first one, very quickly, um, what resources, uh, financial resources, human resources, land and real estate, we talked about that one earlier this morning with uh, PNG. Uh, the looking for the ability to be able to find the real estate resources, infrastructure and providing policy support. I'm going to go through these very quickly. What has been the financial impact of the special economic zones? Well, SEZs have attracted significant foreign investment into China, which has helped to modernise industries and promote technological transfer. It's boosted e uh, exports, job creation, 
uh, increased new, uh, increased tax revenue comes back to the government once an industry has uh, been established. So what other uh, benefits uh, have there been? Technological transfer. You know, the whole electric vehicle technology, for example, you know, Elon Musk took his uh, Tesla car into China and now he's having to compete with all the other EVs that are being built in China. And so uh, China's been accused of stealing technology, but I want to, I've been into factories and I realise it's not a case of stealing technology at all. Learning from the technology by all means, but then leapfrogging and developing even better, stronger, cheaper technologies. And China has the ability to do that. Uh, experimentation and innovation and the development of infrastructure. This is uh, how uh, uh, SEZs have given back. So how much foreign trade has been generated since 1979 or 1980 till the end of 2020? 40 years, the country's SEZs have attracted a total of 2.9 trillion US dollars in foreign investment. In 2020 alone, China's SEZs attracted 1. Uh, uh, 179 billion in uh, foreign investment, which accounted for 15.9% of the country's total foreign investment inflows. <laughs> Which industries have benefited most in China? Well, manufacturing mainly, uh, that's the most important one. Information technology, the IT industry, and of course the development of smart chips and other things uh, associated with that is just starting to boom now. Logistics and transportation, that's why it's been possible for the very fast train network to develop. Financial services uh, have also benefited. Tourism and hospitality. This is another area that has been a big boom in, uh, in China. And I think uh, the, these are areas in which uh, PNG could also, also prosper. So what have been the successes and failures? Well, I've talked about the successes, but let's have a look at uh, some of the areas of problems. Uh, SEZs have contributed to income inequality. If you're living in the Guangdong province, for example, your wages have probably not only doubled, but trebled in the last 20 years. Uh, more so uh, in the last 10 years. When I first arrived in China 12 years ago, my staff would have to ride a bike or catch a bus. Those people now have a car of their own and they've moved out of renting an apartment into an apartment of their own. Middle China, 400 million people have uh, emerged as a result of uh, uh, greater income. So it's, it's the manufacturing centre of uh, the world, but not because wages are cheaper there anymore, particularly in Guangdong, where it's very difficult to keep wages down low. It's also had an impact on the environment. As this middle China has grown up, they want to have air conditioning in their home. And uh, the reliance on electricity is higher now than it's ever been, using more equipment, less human uh, in, uh, interventions so that uh, the products can be made more economically. But uh, it's meant that there's a huge cost to the environment in the uh, use of electricity. There's also been an over-reliance on foreign investment. And this is something, you know, you may want to attract foreign investment here, but once it starts flowing, you'll find that you start to rely on it, and that can become a danger as well. Um, and some SEZs have become so flush with money and, and ideas from elsewhere that they have not, the people themselves are not as innovative as what they have been before. Intellectual property rights and inadequate legal frameworks have also provided uh, regulatory challenges as well, trying to keep up with the speed of it all. So as, as I conclude, I, um, 
Yes, SEZs have a significant role to play in China. But I think uh, PNG has an immense opportunity here. You know, this middle China that I was talking about, 12 years ago, were not drinking coffee, right? But now there are coffee shops on every corner. They used to drink tea. The older generation drinks tea, but now the younger generation in the middle China wants coffee. And I believe that you're not growing enough coffee here in uh, PNG to be able to s service the needs of just China, let alone any other country. Is that a problem or is that an opportunity? Both? <laughs> well, I think the, you know, we talked about land uh, this morning. You know, you're not short of land here, PNG, but Minister, I do understand that you've got issues to deal with as you start to look for the, the best return on the investment for the land that you've got here in this country for the sake of all people in this country to be able to uh, provide employment and uh, be able to do things that you couldn't do before. You know, I really believe that if you can provide solid, growing employment, you will deal with the problems of the restless youth and uh, uh, the issues that you've got on your streets. Do you agree with me? You can get more young people involved, give, give them a job, give them a hope and a future. I believe that lawlessness will cease to become a problem here. But you need to get out and tell the world about the best secret in the world, which is PNG. The Kogoda track. You know, there's opportunities there to have accommodation and uh, all sorts of things to promote it as, uh, for tourism. You've got some amazing landscapes and places for people to visit, but you need to get out there and promote. And in fact, I believe the biggest cons uh, problem that you've got, Minister, is the problem of marketing. You need to tell the world that PNG is here waiting for you. Come! Come to PNG. Come and uh, visit this beautiful country. You know, it was Prime Minister Churchill who uh, visited his old school and he made the shortest speech in the world. He got up, he, he leaned on their rostrum and he spoke to the boys and he said, never, never, never give up. And then he sat down. It was the shortest speech, Mr. Moderator. It uh, must have been a blessing to have someone who could keep a speech so short. But that's a key message for you. Never, never, never give up. You've only just started on the journey. You've only just started. You've got so much to look forward to, and this can be an incredibly prosperous nation. Thank you for your time today.